Well, good morning and happy Easter, and hope you've had a great week, and glad we can be in the Lord's house to celebrate and worship together. Did you all have a, a good breakfast this morning? Was it good? That was good. Good to fellowship with one another, good to serve the Lord. Let's stand together, page 239, in Christ alone, as we start worshiping this morning. And as we look at this song, it really walks us through what Christ has done. How he, he humbled himself, he came, he was born, he, he was died, he was buried, but he rose again. And he conquered death, he conquered sin for us. Let's sing together in Christ alone, page 239. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid crown. Turn to the fiercest droughts and storm. What heights of love, what depths of when fears are stilled, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ. On that third verse together, there in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose. And as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his and he is mine, blood with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death, this is the power of Christ in me. Well, good morning. If you had to see you this Easter morning, we're glad you're here with us. And uh, we have a reason to sing and celebrate today, don't we? We have a risen Savior, and what a great day to celebrate that. Luke chapter 24 says this. It says, Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came to the sepulcher, bringing spices which they had prepared, and certain others with them. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher. And they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. And it came to pass, as they were much, per much perplexed thereabouts, Behold, two men stood by them shining in shining garments, and as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. Praise the Lord. Would you join me as we ask the Lord to be with us this morning? Lord, we thank you for this opportunity uh, to come and to fellowship, and uh, Lord, just to worship and to celebrate what you have done for us. And uh, your resurrection means everything. It's where our hope comes from. It's where our victory comes from. It's our hope of eternal life. It's our hope of a future. And we just cannot praise you for it enough. Lord, I pray that as we gather together this morning that you, uh, first and foremost, would be glorified, that you would be exalted, and that you would just receive the praise that is due your name. And I pray that you would help us uh, just to have a better glimpse of who you are and to draw closer to you and that you would work in our lives today. We just ask all these things in your name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Angels announce 
Amen. Let's continue worshiping together this morning. Let's stand and we'll echo what the choir just sang. Page 387, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because there is victory, because there is power over death. Let's stand together. Page 387, because he lives. God sent his son, they called him Jesus, he came to know, heal and forgive, he lived and died, to buy my pardon, an empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives, because he lives, I can face We'll sing that last verse here in just a moment, but the choir's going to come down, shake hands, greet those around you. We'll sing that third verse here in just a minute. Amen. Let's sing together on that third verse, and then one day I'll cross the river. And then one day I'll cross the river, I'll find life's final war with pain. And then as death gives way to victory, I'll see the lights of glory and I'll know Cause he lives, I can face tomorrow, because he lives, all fear is gone, because I know he holds the future, and life is worth the living just because he Amen. Well, the music's been wonderful this morning and prepared our hearts. Thank you so much for that. Men, if you would come, we'll take this morning's tithes and offerings. And I do just want to take a moment and thank all of our guests that are here with us. And I just want to give a, a special welcome and let you know how much we appreciate you being here. And uh, on your way out, make sure at the Welcome Center we have just a little bag to say thank you and uh, appreciation for your time with us. And I'll share one quick announcement with you before our offering. Fourth, fifth, and sixth grade next Sunday, right after the service, is going to have a no beach beach party okay and so that'll be here at the church until 2 30 and so parents just be aware of that all right well brother bill would you mind leaving some prayer for our offering this morning Amen. You may be seated.
Aren't you thankful Christ the Lord is risen today? Let's stand together. We'll sing one final song this morning, page 263. As we look at our Savior, as he is risen, he has conquered death. And he is a wonderful and a merciful and a loving Savior, that he would do that on our behalf. Let's sing together, page 263, if you need it in your hymnals, Wonderful, Merciful Savior. Wonderful, merciful Savior, precious Redeemer and friend, who would have thought that a lamb could rescue the souls of men. Oh, you rescue the souls of men. You are the one that we praise. You together on that last as we sing that final verse kids you can be dismissed back to the gym for junior church sixth grade and under as we sing that last when we get to that final chorus we'll have our instruments drop out and we'll just sing all those beautiful parts worshiping our savior together on that chorus let's sing on that last almighty infinite father almighty infinite father faithfully loving Great singing this morning. You may be seated. taken, he laid it down. What a beautiful sacrifice, what an offering he made. Calvary's cross was the altar, sin's debt was paid. Give portrait of grace, given, given, praise the Lamb that was slain. Hope was hidden inside the tomb, heavy stones sealed the door. 
It was our shame he took there, our grief he bore. Buried, buried in the grave for three days. Buried, buried, praise the Lamb that was slain. glory of Sunday's dawn, there was no sting of death, our Redeemer victorious, just as he said, risen, risen, he has conquered the Risen, risen, he has conquered the grave. Risen, risen, praise the Lamb that was slain. Jesus, Jesus, name above every name. Jesus. Jesus, praise the Lamb that was slain. Jesus, Jesus, name above every name. Jesus, Jesus, praise the Lamb that was slain. Praise the Lamb that was slain. Praise the Lamb that was slain. His life was not taken. He laid it down. What a thought. We went to uh, the Passion Play this last week over in Noblesville, and uh, just an excellent uh, depiction of the Passion of Christ and the scene where Christ came out the back and uh, the brutality that was done to him and all that he went through. And uh, I don't think there was a dry eye in the house, was there, Patty? And you see what Christ went through, and, and he didn't have to. He laid it down. It was given. And he died, but... Uh, he did not stay dead, amen? amen? He rose again. And that's what today is all about. That's what we celebrate today. And if you would join me in John chapter 20, I'd like for us to look at that. To look at the resurrection of Christ and the implications that that has for us today. And I want to bring a message entitled, The Tomb is Still Empty. Because really that's the basis of, uh, of all of our hope. If the tomb's not empty, we have no hope. But if that tomb is empty, we have eternal hope. Look what it says in John chapter 20. In John 20, verse 1, it says this. It says, The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulchre, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulchre. Then she runneth, and cometh to Simon, and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre, and we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth, and that other disciple, and came to the sepulchre. So they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulcher. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter, following him, and went into the sepulcher. And seeth the linen clothes, uh, clothes lie in the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also the other disciple, which came first to the sepulcher, and saw and believed. Lord, we come to you this morning, and it's been a wonderful morning. Uh, I thank you for the uh, message and song. I thank you for the worship. And uh, Lord, I pray that you've been glorified so far today. I pray that you'd be glorified as we open your word. I pray that you would just be exalted as we remember what you have done and your power over death and your victory over sin, and that you would just be uh, honored today with the honor that only you deserve. We thank you for all you've done. Jesus, I pray. Amen. I heard about a pastor. He was driving to church on Easter Sunday, and his car broke down on the way. And, uh, of course, he couldn't be late on Easter Sunday, and so he called an Uber to come pick him up. And, 
And the driver came, and he hopped in the car, and about halfway to the church, the pastor asked the Uber driver a question. Well, apparently the driver didn't hear him because he didn't respond, and so the, the pastor reached out and tapped the man on the shoulder. And the driver, he just screamed, and he swerved into the other lane. He about hit another car. He, he pulled off of the shoulder and slammed on the brakes, and, and they just kind of caught their breath for a second. And the pastor looked at him and said, uh, sir, I am sorry. I did not mean to startle you so bad. And, and the, the driver said, well, it's, it's really not your fault. He said, uh, this is my first week driving Uber. For the past 25 years, I've been driving a hearse. <laughs> I tell you, he was just about as surprised as the people we read about in John 20. You see, in John 20, Mary Magdalene and the disciples, they... They had seen Christ die. Uh, they, they had seen what all his body had gone through. They had, they had seen the, the spear thrust through his side. They had seen his lifeless body taken off the cross and, and laid in a tomb. They, they had no doubt in their minds that Christ was dead. And yet by the end of chapter 20, there is, there is just as little doubt that he had risen again. You see, Christ, he, he conquered death. He came back from the grave, and, and it's a glorious truth. The glorious truth of the resurrection. I want to share with you four truths this morning about the resurrection and, and four truths that, that really change the way we live life when we understand them. This moment when the unexplainable was overrun by the undeniable and Christ overcame death and conquered death. I want to share four thoughts with you. The first one is this. I want you to see that the resurrection is a confirmed fact. The resurrection is a confirmed fact. We see this in verses 1 through 10. You see, on Friday, Christ had been crucified. And the people that killed Christ, they did everything they could to make sure that Christ stayed dead. They, they put a stone in front of the tomb. They put a squadron of Roman soldiers in front of the tomb to make so, sure no one would come in and no one would go out. There was no doubt in his, their minds that, that Christ was dead. And look what they say in verse 1. It says, now on the first day of the week, that would be Sunday, that's why we're here today. Uh, every Sunday at church is a celebration of the resurrection of Christ, but, but obviously with Easter, there is just this special emphasis as we remember what Christ has done. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene, early when it was yet dark into the sepulcher, and seeth the stone taketh away from the sepulcher. You see, the other gospel writers let us know that as Mary came to the tomb, she was not alone. There were other ladies with her, and, and do you know why she came to the tomb? Do you know what she was expecting? She was not expecting to see a risen Savior, that's for sure. She wasn't even expecting to see a, a tomb that was open. It tells us in the book of Mark that she came, and, and when she came, she brought spices with her to clean up the body. Do you know why she came? It's because the Bible tells us there were two guys. It was Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. They, they took Jesus' body off the cross, and they prepared his bodies. Now, uh, ladies, how many of you uh, have ever had a couple of guys come in and do cleanup, and then you had to come back in and clean up their cleanup? You ever had that happen before? That's what Mary's doing. Uh, she's saying, that's cute that you think you've fixed this problem now. Now let me in there, boys, is what she's saying. Mary comes in verse 1, and, and she comes, and what she sees is she sees that the stone is taken away. Now, now what is her instant reaction to that? It's the same that ours would be. Her reaction wouldn't have been, well, Christ must have risen. Her reaction was, someone must have come and taken the body of Christ. And so what she does is she runs, and look what she does in verse 2. It says, then she runneth and come to Simon Peter and the other disciple whom Jesus loved. Now, Peter here, she, he, she comes and she sees Peter, and, and she also comes and sees the other disciple whom Jesus loved. Are you Bible scholars, what, what disciple is being referred to here? It's disciple John, which, by the way, is only referred to by this name in the Gospel of John, which was written by John. Come on, John. Uh, I mean, everybody knows you cannot give yourself your own nickname, right? That's the rule. And uh, if that was possible, Downing Thomas would have a different nickname. I guarantee you that if he knew you could do this. And John, he, he, uh, Mary, she comes to him, and she comes to Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved. Now, that's interesting. The, the way John referred to himself 
was characterized and the, the core of his identity was formed by the fact that he was the one whom Jesus loved. Now, can I ask you this? How, uh, how would your life be different if you understood what John understood? That you are the one whom Jesus loved. You know, sometimes I, I talk to people and and because of the way life has gone and things that have happened or, or maybe things that have not happened, they, they doubt, does God really love me? Or maybe the things they have done and the actions they've taken, they, they say, can God still love me? And, and I would just encourage you, if you struggle with that, then flip your Bible back one page to John chapter 19. And what you will see there is you will see the crucifixion and the suffering of Jesus Christ. And understand as you read that passage that every ounce of suffering that Christ is experiencing, he is doing it because you are the one whom Jesus loves. You will see his body is beaten and he is humiliated and he is stripped and he has pierced uh, nails through his hands and uh, a spear through his side. And he did every bit of it because you are the one whom Jesus loved. He did all of it. He drank every ounce of suffering. He, he laid his life down freely because of his love for us. I've said it before, but if you want to know whether or not God loves you, do not look at your circumstances. Look at the cross. And if you ever doubt that you have a Savior who, who loves you and, and you are precious to, look at the price that he paid. And John, she runs to Simon, she runs to, to Peter, and she runs to John, and, and John is the one whom Jesus loved. And in verse 3 and 4, this is funny. There's not a wasted word in Scripture. It says in verse 3, John wants you to know something very specifically here. He says, Peter, therefore, went forth and the other disciples. So he's saying, hey, there is something I need you to make sure you know, and that is me and Peter, we left for the tomb at the same time. And then he says, and he came to the sepulcher, and so he's saying, hey, make sure, don't miss it. He did not get a head start on me, and then look what John says. So they ran both together. And the other disciple did outrun Peter. <laughs> now, that's a guy if I ever saw one, isn't it? Uh, he's saying this. Uh, John, at this point, he's saying, there's a couple things I want you to know. I want you to know, one, that Jesus is alive. He says, two, I want you to know that Jesus loves me best. And third of all, he says, I want you to know that my 40 time is better than Peter's 40 time. That's what I want you to know. Uh, he knows I, Peter, he's a big deal, and he's the rock, and he, he walked on water, but on dry ground, John has him beat is what he's saying here. <laughs> So they both ran together, they, they get to the tomb, and look what happens in verse 5. And stooping down, remember John is just there by himself, he's there first. And stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes, in, clothes lying there, yet went he not in. So John's fast, but he's not brave. <laughs> John gets to the tomb, he's there first, he's by himself. He looks inside, he says, I'm not going in there. You kidding me? And about that time, Peter comes, and Peter, with his, his bold personality, he, he hops in there, and, and once he gets in there, what they see is this. They see that the linen clothes, the burial clothes of Christ, they are neatly folded, which, uh, again, is an evidence that the body was not stolen. How many of you have ever stolen something before? <laughs> that, that was supposed to be more of a rhetorical question, but, but I saw a few. And uh, Sam, could we put a couple extra people on the offering back there, maybe? <laughs> when you steal something, at least this is what they tell me, you, you go into a house to rob it, you don't stop to fold the laundry that's in the house, right? You go in and you, you take it and go. And you definitely, if you were stealing the body of Christ, you would not have gone in and unwrapped the 125 pounds of burial clothes and, and folded it neatly. And so now at this point in the story, we know two things about this tomb. One, we know it is Jesus' tomb because it has his calling card right there, the, the, the grave clothes. But second of all, we know this, the tomb is empty. And that makes all the difference. Uh, you may say, what? well, why do you Christians make such a big deal about the empty tomb? It's because if the tomb was not empty, then Christianity is not true. If the grave was not empty, if Christ did not raise from the dead, then, then there is no hope. You see, there's no other faith in the world that claims that its leader actually rose from the dead. You can go around the world today, the Taj Mahal and, and different places, and you can see the bones and the tombs of great religious leaders of the past. But, but Jesus' tomb, it is famous not for who is in there, but for who is not in there. Because the tomb was empty. John makes it crystal clear, the tomb is empty. And by the end of the chapter, you'll recognize that Christ has shown himself in his resurrected body, both to Mary Magdalene and then to ten of the disciples and then to Doubting Thomas. In 1 Corinthians, we're told that, that Paul was citing this and he said, 
that Christ showed himself in his resurrected body to over 500 people after his resurrection. And he was doing that as evidence to those who may not believe and saying, hey, if you don't believe that Christ rose from the dead, then there are 500 witnesses out there that you can go and talk to personally at the time he wrote that letter. Uh, can you imagine that? Can you imagine going into a courtroom, having to prove that Christ had truly risen from the grave, and you had not one or five or 25, but 500 eyewitnesses flood the courtroom, take the stand, take the oath, and say, I don't know what else to tell you, but I saw Christ, and he is alive. It is a confirmed fact. One Harvard professor said this. He said, according to the laws of legal evidence used in courts of law, there is more evidence for the historical resurrection of Jesus Christ than just about any other event in history. Mark it down. Christ is risen. It's not a myth. It's not a legend. It is a confirmed fact. We have a risen Savior. We see in verses 1 through 10, we see that we have a confirmed fact. Second of all, I'd like you to see that the resurrection is a comforting reality. In verse, if you look over with me in verse 11, it says this. It says, But Mary stood without at the sepulcher weeping, and as she wept, she, sto she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher. Peter and John, they go back home at this point. And Mary, she is left there, and she's at the tomb by herself, and she is just weeping at this point. You see, Mary and Christ had just a very special relationship. Uh, before Mary Magdalene met Christ, she, she had a life that was characterized by demon possession and radical sin. We're told that there were seven different spirits that lived inside of her. And, and really, we could say this, her life was a train wreck. Nobody could help her. No one could, could give her the hope that she needed until she met Christ. And Christ did for her what he does for anyone. He, he comes into a hopeless life and he brings hope to a hopeless life. And he comes alongside her, and, and Christ, he loves her, and he delivers her, and he, he gives her a new life. And Mary, she never forgot that. She was completely dedicated to Christ. In fact, when he was being crucified, and the, the, the disciples, they scattered out of fear. Mary, she was right there at the foot of the cross. The entire time that Christ was dying, she could see him, and he could see her. It was just uh, this unbelievable bond between these two. And she's there, and she's weeping, and, and then we see that that an angel speaks to her in verse 13 and says this, And they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Now, I have a house full of girls. I ask this question about once a day. What, what are you crying about, babe? What, what, what's wrong? The, the angel looks at her and says, he says, Lady, why are you crying? He says, don't, don't you know it's Easter? You can't cry on Easter. That's like crying on your birthday. It's, it's just not allowed. What, why are you crying? We have been waiting for this day for a long time. And we are celebrating up in heaven. Why, why are you crying? Why are you weeping? And about that time, Christ comes and he begins to talk to her. Look at verse 14. It says, And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. And Jesus said unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? And she, supposing him to be the gardener, said unto him, Sir, if thou have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Mary, she's so caught up in everything going on that she totally missed the one that it was all about. She was so racked up in her circumstances and her grief and, and what was happening that, that she totally missed Christ in the whole story. Didn't even see him. We, uh, when we had our second child, Allie, over at Ball Hospital, we were over there, and, and uh, of course, you've been to a hospital, you know, every 10, 15, 20 minutes, they're coming in and, and checking something or telling you something, that sort of thing, and, and uh, usually that's fine, uh, but IU was playing that night when we were over there, and uh, it had just gone into overtime with Michigan State, and about that time, a nurse came in and wanted to tell us some things about uh, the baby and all that sort of thing. And here's the thing. We already had one kid. We kind of knew how they worked. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And uh, so I, uh, I'm sitting there, and the lady walks in, and right over her shoulder is this overtime game against Michigan State. We won, by the way. And uh, <laughs> I've got to hold on to that, because us Hoosier fans, we don't have much to hold on to right now. Don't amen that. You don't have to. <laughs> And she's, she's telling us all this information, and, and uh, I am locked in, uh, but not really on her, you know, more around her. 
And I, I think when she left, she felt like she really connected with me. Like, <laughs> like that was the most passionate father I've ever seen about swaddling right there. And uh, she walked out, the, the game's over, and Karis looked at me and she said, she said, you didn't hear a word that nurse said, did you? And I said, what nurse? <laughs> Now, here's the thing. She, she was talking to me, but, but I didn't hear her. Not really. Here, Christ, he's talking to Mary, but she doesn't hear him. Not really. I tell you, it would be a shame to come to Easter and to do the egg hunts and the breakfast and, and the Easter outfits and pictures and, and all that sort of thing and, and never actually hear Jesus throughout all of it. To, to come and do all the activity and all that's going on and, and never let him truly speak to you, that'd be a tragedy. Mary, she's here and she hears him, but she doesn't really hear him. And so Jesus, he persists and, and gently he says to her just one word, verse 16, Jesus saith unto her, Mary. Boy, when she heard that name being spoken, she goes, I know that voice. I've heard that call before. And she turns and she recognizes that, that the one that is speaking to her was the one that was dead and now is not dead. It's the one that had changed her life like no one else had changed her life. The one that loved her like no one else loved her. And, and she saw him and she turned and it says that, that she said unto him, Rabbani, which is the idea of, of precious master. And all of a sudden, all the, the, the sadness was gone. Uh, because there was nothing left to be sad about. Because death had been defeated. You know, we, we live in a world where there is a lot of fear and there is a lot of uncertainty uh, about death. I read about Socrates. Remember, he was forced to drink hemlock, and one of his students asked him, they said, shall we live again? And the best answer he could give was this, I hope so, but no man can know. The oldest book in the Bible is the book of Job, and, and in that book, Job asked the question, he says, if a man dies, does he go on living? Is that not the same question people are asking today? What happens after death? Uh, Ecclesiastes tells us that God has placed eternity into our hearts. In other words, there is something inside of you that just knows there is more to life than just this life. And when someone you love passes away, you know they're not truly gone because God has placed eternity in our hearts. We know there's something more. And can I care encourage you with this? If, if you have put your faith in Jesus Christ... There is nothing to fear, and there is nothing to be uncertain about when it comes to death. You see, because Christ, he defeated death that morning when he stepped out of the tomb. And for those of us that know Christ as Savior, it truly is not death to die. Uh, for us to die on this earth is simply a change of address. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. 1 Corinthians says this, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? You see, it's the resurrections that gives us hope that this life and death is not the end. It is the resurrection of Christ that gives us hope that those that we love that have gone to be with the Lord before us, we will see them again. It's the hope of the resurrection. It is a comforting reality. If you have been around our church, you know that we have been uh, praying at our church for the Jordan family. Uh, Don, she grew up in our church and, and a very good friend, and uh, her son... And his wife, Nathan and Haley, they, they were married. They were expecting their first little boy. And, and several weeks before her due date, Haley suffered a blood clot very unexpectedly and, and tragically passed away. And they were able to do an emergency C-section and, and, and thankfully save the little boy. And he's doing well from what I understand today. But, but at her funeral, they said there were thousands and thousands of people that came up uh, to remember her life. And they were telling me that that some of our ladies went down to be with them and to celebrate with them. And, and while they were down there, they said the, the funeral was not like any funeral they had been to before because, yes, there was this tremendous amount of sorrow for the loss and, and what had happened, but, but there was also this incredible hope and even, even passionate worship of God in the midst of that. And you say, how, how can you respond that way when you lose someone you love? And I can tell you the answer is this. It's because we do not serve the God of the dead, but we serve the God of the living. Amen. And we will see the ones that have gone on before us in the Lord. We will see them again. Can I ask you a question? Are you ready for that day? Are you ready for that day that you will face death? 
It may be at age 24 like Haley. It may be age 94. But, but there will come a day where each of us, we will take our last breath here on this earth. And at that point, we, we will enter into eternity. It tells us that it is appointed that a man wants to die, and after this, the judgment. You can't avoid it, but you can prepare for it. And God has given in this short window that we call life, and that is our opportunity to prepare for eternity. You have this life to put your trust in Jesus Christ. And here's the thing. When you put your trust in him, his victory over death, his resurrection, it counts for you. That is why we have hope in the midst of loss. That is why we do not fear death. We do not have uncertainty about death because we have a Savior who has conquered death. The resurrection is a comforting reality. Third of all, let me share this with you. The resurrection is a consuming motivation. Verse 19. At this point, it's the same day, but it's evening time. And and it says, Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst, and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had said this, he showed unto them his hand and his side, and then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Here the disciples, they're, they're fearful. They're, they're together, and they're in hiding, and they've locked the door, and you would be too, because they had just seen what the Jews had done to their leader a couple days earlier, and, and they're afraid the same thing's going to happen to them. And so as they're in hiding and seclusion and, and fearful, Christ comes to them. And he appears to them in this room, and, and he shows them the, the scars in his hands and the wound in his side, and, and it says they were very glad to see the Lord. And then the Lord does two things with these men. In verse 21, we see he commissions them. It says, And then, he, then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. He's commissioning them. He's saying the same way the Father has sent me, he's saying, now I am sending you. He's saying, I am putting you on assignment to take the news of my resurrection to the world. He commissions them. But then in verses 22 and 23, he empowers them. He says in verse 22, and when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. He empowers them. It says that he, he breathes on them. Now, this was uh, before COVID, so it was okay back then to do this. And he breathes on them, and, and he tells them, he says, I'm going to give you, uh, I'm giving you the authority to go out and tell people how they can have their sins forgiven. I'm giving you the authority to go and tell people that in my name, their sins can be forgiven, and if they reject my name, their sins will not be forgiven. That's what he's called, called them to do. Now, it has been well noted by pastors that, the difference between these disciples before they saw the resurrected Christ and who they were after they saw the resurrected Christ. Before Christ appeared to them, they were uh, fearful and discouraged and ready to quit. Peter, he had gone back to fishing, but, but after they saw the resurrected Savior, all that changed. All of a sudden, they, they were a group of men who were once cowards, and, and now they are going to shoot out of Jerusalem with the gospel like a cannon and take it and turn the world upside down. And, and what made the difference? It was the fact that they realized their Savior was a resurrected Savior, that he truly is the Son of God. Do you realize that, that 10 out of the 11 of these disciples, they, they literally were martyred for spreading the gospel? From Jerusalem to Rome, it was turned upside down by these men, and all of it was because they saw the resurrection of Jesus Christ and were empowered by the Spirit of God. I tell you, when you wrap your heart around the fact of what Christ has done, it will change the way you live. When you realize the love and the sacrifice he has made, it, it will compel you to live for him. Well, we don't live for the Lord because we have to. We don't, we don't serve him because we are forced to. We serve the Lord because we love him and we want to serve him. And it's a privilege to serve him. We see the resurrection. It is a consuming motivation. And finally, let me share one last thought with you. I want you to see that the resurrection is a compassionate invitation. It's a compassionate invitation. It says in verse 24, it says, But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, that, that word Didymus is the idea, he is a twin. We get our word ditto from that. I know we have some triplets here. That, that's the word here. He's saying Thomas the twin was not with them when Jesus came. 
And the other disciples therefore saith unto him, We have seen the Lord, but he saith unto them, Except I shall see in his hand the prints of the nails, and put my finger in the prints of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. So uh, apparently the first time that Christ has appeared, uh, Thomas had missed Bible study that day. And all the other disciples, they'd go to Thomas and they, they try to tell him what had happened and, and explain what was going on. And he said, he said I'm not going to do it. So I'm not going to believe it. I've gotten my hopes up before and, and he disappointed me. I, I put my hope in Christ and now, now he's a dead man. I, I'm not going to put myself through that again. And he says, unless I can take my finger and put it through the holes in his hands and thrust my hand through the, the hole in his side, he says, I'm not going to believe. Now, what I really like here is how Jesus responds. Uh, maybe you've been where Judas is or where uh, Thomas is here. Have you been to a point in your life where your doubts were bigger than your faith? You say, I, uh, God, I, I, I am struggling here. I'm struggling to trust that you're good. I'm struggling, struggling to trust that, that, that you're the true way and the true salvation. And look what Christ does with Thomas. In verse 27, Christ comes to him and says, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach thither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believed. Christ, he comes to him here, and he, he comes to Thomas with just such compassion. You know, what I've found is God does not mind honest doubts. And when we come to God with honest and sincere doubts, not, not hard-hearted unbelief, but honest doubts, he, he's willing to work with that. And Thomas, he was struggling, he was doubting, and, and there is a difference between hard-hearted uh, doubt and, or, or sincere doubt and hard-hearted disbelief. I like what one man said. He said, doubt is asking the sincere question. Unbelief won't hear the answers. And Thomas here, he was asking sincere questions. Well, when you're wrestling with your doubts, uh, what happens at the end of the day is if you bring them to the Lord, your faith comes out on the other side much stronger. Because look what he says in verse 28. Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Can you imagine someone trying to talk Thomas out of his faith after this moment with Christ? After taking those moments of doubt and, and allowing God to help him walk through them, on, on the other side his faith was forged and and maybe you're here and you're, you're doubting. And you say, really, I, I don't know if I believe that Christianity is the way. I, I don't know if God has my best interest at heart. Can, can I be helpful to you this morning? Bring those to the Lord. When you come with an honest and sincere heart, he can work with that. What Christ does is he, he lovingly offers to let Thomas put his finger in the holes and, and his uh, fist through his side. And why did Christ do that? He did it so that he wouldn't be faithless but believing. Christ came to Thomas and he met Thomas where he was. He could have given up on Thomas, but instead he pursued Thomas. Some of you here, you may say, well, I've, I turned my back on God when I was a teenager. I, I wonder if God has turned his back on me. I can assure you he hasn't. Some of you, you say, I, I have been away from God for so long and I've done so many things. I, I wonder if God can even redeem my life at this point. He can Christ, he came to Thomas in this moment where he, he could have given up on Thomas, but instead he pursued Thomas. And I just want to encourage you, I don't know how far you are from the Lord this morning, but, but the mercy of God that showed up in Thomas' life, he would be more than happy to allow to show up in your life. The resurrection, we see it as a compassionate invitation. And then as we close, look how John changes the tone of the message in verse, verse 30. It says that many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ and the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. This verse here, John, he changes the tone. He goes from the narrator of a story to a commenter, to a commentator. And he says, I, I want you to know why I'm telling you all this. The reason I've written this whole book and I've taken this whole chapter to tell you about Christ is, is because at the end of the day, I want you to personally believe. Jesus Christ. He makes a couple of assumptions in this verse. He, he, he first of all assumes that, that until we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we cannot have eternal life. That, that assumes that before we come to Christ, we, we are dead spiritually. 
And he says, I want you to come to Christ so that you can have eternal life. Look what he says. He says, it is written these that ye might believe. You could take the word ye out and you could put your name in there. He said, I've written this that, that Brian might believe. That Jesus Christ is the risen Savior. That Nathan may believe that Jesus Christ is the risen Savior. I tell you, at some point, your faith has to become personal. It's not enough just to have a, a grandparent that believes in the Lord. It's not enough to come to a church that, that preaches the Lord. It's, it's at some point you have to put your own personal faith in Jesus Christ. And come to him and say, Lord, I, I know I'm a sinner. I know I don't deserve to go to a place called heaven, but, but I believe. I believe that you love me. I believe that you came to the earth and lived a perfect life and you died a sinless death and, and rose again victorious over the grave. And, and I believe that what you did can count to my account. Lord, would you please forgive me and be my Savior? There has to be a point you do that. There has to be a point where you allow Christ's victory to speak for you. I'll end with this story. There was a young man in the uh, Revolutionary War and as uh, they were fighting, he he was hit, and he could tell it was going to be a fatal shot. And so he, he was able to crawl back to the barracks and found his tent. And, and he crawled in the tent, and when they found him, they found out sprawled in front of him uh, the Bible to the book of John to chapter 11. And underlined in that chapter was verses 25. He had uh, underlined it with his lifeblood. And the, the verse he held on to in those dying moments was this. Jesus was speaking, and he, he had highlighted, I and the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Do you believe that? Has there been a time where you have put your faith in the work of Christ? Would you bow your head with me, close your eyes? With no one looking around, every head bowed, every eye closed, I, I just want to ask you a simple question. You say, you know, Pastor Brian, you talked today about how we need to be prepared for that day where we will meet the Lord. And to be honest, at this point in my life, if, if I were to meet the Lord, I don't think I'd be ready. But I've heard what you've said about Christ and how I can be prepared, and, and that's something I'm concerned about. And you say, Pastor, would you just pray for me? I'm not sure that I would go to heaven if I would die, but I'm concerned about it. Would you just raise your hand? No one else is looking around. I, I don't know that I've been saved, but that's something I'd like to do. Amen. You can put your hands back down. Uh, I'm going to lead you in what's called the sinner's prayer. If you've never accepted Christ, I, I would invite you to pray this prayer with me. And, and uh, it's not the words that will save you. It is what John said. It is belief in what Christ did on the cross that will save you. But if you've never done that, you want to express your uh, asking the Lord to save you from your sins, I would encourage you to pray along with me silently as I pray aloud. Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. Lord, I know that because of my sins, I do not deserve to go to a perfect and holy place called heaven. But Lord, I also believe that you came to earth and you were sinless and you died in my place. Lord, I believe that three days later you conquered death and you rose from the grave and and Lord, I put my trust in you. Would you please forgive me of my sins and allow me to be your child? In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Heads bowed and eyes closed still. If you're here and you say, you know, Pastor Brian, I just prayed that this morning. I asked the Lord to be my Savior and to, to come into my life. If that's you, would you just raise your hand? We won't call you out and embarrass you, but, but boy, we'd love to celebrate with you. Amen. Uh, I'll ask you one thing. On your way out, uh, come say hi to me. I have a uh, a book or two I'd like to give you to help you as you start your walk with the Lord and, and following Him. And that's an exciting thing to receive the Lord. Lord, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for what you did on the cross. We thank you for what it means. We thank you for the hope that it gives. Lord, I thank you for those that uh, today have come to you and asked you to be their Lord and Savior. What a wonderful thing. Lord, I pray that you would be with us as we go here from here, both those that have just gotten saved and those that have been saved for years, that we would live in light of what you've done for us. And we would love you and we would worship you and that uh, we would live our lives for you. We thank you for all you've done for us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Would you stand with me, please? We'll stand together and we'll sing 365. hymn 365 as we sing together hymn 365.
until the work on earth is done. Amen. Well, thank you again for joining us today. And again, if you're a visitor, a uh, special thank you for being here. Make sure you grab a bag on your way out and uh, look forward to seeing you again. Well, let's pray and we'll be dismissed. Pastor Joey, would you mind dismissing us in prayer? Lord, we thank you so much for just the time this morning to reflect on what you've done for us. Thank you for uh, just living a life that's an example to us. And most of all, we thank you for, for dying in our place, for raising again and, and conquering death uh, on our behalf. Lord, I just ask that you would help us this week as we go out, that we would remember that, that that would motivate us as we live, that we would live for you because you have died for us, and that we would share that, and that, that people would just come to know you through our lives. Lord, we just thank you so much. I ask that you just give us a, a week where we glorify you. Help us uh, even today as we're with family and those around us that we would enjoy that time that continues to worship you and remember what you have done for us. Thank you once again for who you are and all that you've done. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.